Okay, so welcome to today's webinar and thank you for joining us today. My name is Yvonne Harris. I am a registered nurse and a nursing advisor on the practice team here at the SRNA. My role today is to help facilitate the webinar. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge that this presentation is being held on Aboriginal land and recognize the strength, resilience, and capacity of the Treaty 4 and Métis people in this land. Our topic today is Emerging Trends in Healthcare, the Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technologies in Health. And today our guest speaker is Kathleen Kulik from Cadiff. She is the liaison officer uh, between Saskatchewan and Cadiff. Before we get started, I have a couple of notes on how you can engage throughout this presentation. So as a viewer of the webinar, you will be able to hear and see the presentation. Only panelists will be able to speak throughout the presentation. If you do have a question, add them to the Q&A or the uh, chat sections, and we'll be monitoring this area for questions throughout the webinar. And then we'll answer these questions uh, either live or via typed response. If you do wish to send your question anonymously, there is a checkbox at the bottom of the Q&A screen. This webinar will be recorded and it may be posted on the SRNA website for those who could not join today and then they can view it later. Also, an email will be sent to you with a link for the evaluation and it is hoped that you will take a couple of minutes to complete the quick survey. So, now that we have the housekeeping items out of the way, I will turn over the microphone to Kathleen. Great, thank you very much Yvonne. Uh, thank you everyone for either joining today or watching this at a later date. Uh, my name is Kathleen Kulik and I am a registered nurse. Um, I want to acknowledge that I'm based here in Saskatoon, so I am here on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional lands of the Cree peoples and homeland of the Métis. So what am I going to talk about today? I'm going to talk about Cadiff. Um, so for some of you who are uh, watching this, um, Cadiff might be brand new to you, so hopefully you will gain a good understanding of how you can use Cadiff um, in your nursing practice um, and in your clinical encounters. Um, some of you though might be quite familiar with Cadiff and I'm looking to get a refresher or um, perhaps I'm gonna teach you a couple of new things about Cadiff and how you can use our uh, resources. So uh, the way I have um, um, structured this presentation, oops, let me just see if I can, There we go. Um, so the way I've structured this presentation is sort of the five W's and the one H um, that we all learned back in elementary school when we're learning um, how to uh, describe something or understand something, because it's honestly usually the best way to figure out who Cadiff is. Um, so I'm going to talk about who Cadiff is, what we do, when you would actually use it, where we're based, uh, why you would use Cadiff, and how do I use Cadiff. Now I have a little uh, disclaimer there at the bottom. Um, order subject to change. So I'm going to touch on all of these components throughout the presentation in different ways. So just my disclosures to begin. So CADF itself is funded by federal, provincial, and territorial ministries of health, and we do receive application fees for three of our programs. Um, in terms of myself, I have nothing exciting to declare, um, nothing to disclose at all. I am a CADF employee, independently based here in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. So let's start at the very beginning. So CADIS, it doesn't sound like a very intuitive name, that's because it's an acronym. So CADIS stands for Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technologies in Health. So it's quite a long sentence, so we go by CADIS. Um, so there's me on the screen, Kathleen Kulik. I'm the Saskatchewan Liaison Officer. And we actually have two more team members uh, based here in Saskatchewan. Um, both Krista, so if you ever forget any of our names and you guess Krista, you're probably right. So Krista Berquist is based in Regina and she's our program advisor. And Krista Kaminsky is our implementation support officer and she's based in Saskatoon as well. So that's who we are for CADIF in Saskatchewan. So who is CADIF? Uh, we are an independent not-for-profit organization responsible for providing Canada's healthcare decision makers with objective evidence about the optimal use of drugs and medical devices. So obviously that's our very formalized uh, definition of who we are. Um, but if you break it down, you can see, uh, you can gain a little bit more about what um, I'm actually trying to say here. So 
Um, so we are an independent not-for-profit organization. You can see from our, my disclosures, uh, CADF is primarily funded by um, federal, provincial, and territorial ministries of health. So we are funded for, through, um, through the government. Who is healthcare decision makers? Well, that's all of you. So anybody who has a stake in this healthcare system, be it a clinician, administrator, educator, um, Ministry of Health, you are all part of the healthcare system and are a decision maker. <clears throat> and we provide objective evidence about the use of drugs and medical devices, and I'll get a little bit more into that. <clears throat> so CADIS was created to build Canada's capacity to use evidence as the basis for sound healthcare decisions. CADIS has actually been around for 30 years, or now it's, it will be 31 years. Um, so we've been around for quite a long time. And CADIS was initially created to help promote um, evidence-based decision-making. <clears throat> so in the past probably decade or so or longer, <clears throat> um, evidence-based medicine, evidence-based nursing practice in general has definitely become a lot more mainstream and CADIS has really been um, a part of promoting that um, type of, of practice. So we're trying to promote evidence-based decision-making. So that's having evidence at the beginning of your decision-making process to help inform how you might make that decision versus what we're trying to prevent is called decision-based evidence finding or what I call it, it's not an actual term. Um, so what decision-based evidence finding is, is when I get a friend to call from somebody who says, oh, I bought this piece of equipment, please find some research to show that I made the right choice. So we're trying to avoid that as best as possible. So by putting the evidence in the hands of those decision makers up front, so you can make an informed decision. Um, so here's sort of a definition of what evidence-informed decision-making is um, to give you an idea. And keep in mind, uh, all of you as nurses and clinicians, us as nurses and clinicians, you are making decisions every single day in all of the clinical interactions you're making. So um, some of you might be thinking, oh, you know, evidence-informed decision-making, that, you know, that happens by managers or directors. No, this happens by all of us as clinicians. Every decision you make with and for a patient um, comes down to hopefully using some form of evidence-informed decision-making. So this is just another way to represent that, sort of a pictorial representation, sort of how I like to think about it, of what evidence-informed decision-making is. So you can see there that evidence is actually not the only piece of that decision-making process. It's one of many. Um, and that's to recognize that it would be very nice if we had the perfect piece of research that told you exactly how to practice with that specific patient in front of you. But unfortunately, that doesn't usually exist. So we need to incorporate other components into our decision making to help inform us. And that includes our clinical experience, of course, um, the patient perspectives and values, available resources, um, local issues and context. So all that will impact how our decisions are made. Um, so I, I will say this is just tea in here. This is not anything else, it's just tea. <laughs> but, okay, so that's evidence-informed decision-making, what we're trying to promote at CADF. Oops. Okay, so what do we do? So we kind of covered who we are. What do we actually do at CADF? So essentially what we do is we deliver evidence, research findings. Um, with that evidence, we may also provide some advice and recommendations as to the use of that information. Sometimes research isn't as clear cut as we'd hoped it would be. It can sometimes be very confusing. There can be a lot of conflicting information. It can be difficult to siphon out what is it, it is actually trying to say. So we will from time to time provide advice and recommendations onto the, as to the use of that information. As well, what we do is what's known as implementation support. And this is the most important part of um, actually getting research into practice because it's one thing to have a piece of research in front of you telling you what is probably the best way to do you know addressing change or or what medication the patient should be on but how do you actually implement that into practice it's sometimes a little bit more complex and as you saw in that previous diagram I showed you there are lots of things to consider when making that decision it's not always straightforward the kind of decision you might make for your patient in a large tertiary center with lots of access to specialists and care and medical devices might be a lot different to um, you as a clinician if you're working in a remote outpost with limited resources. So uh, the research is just one piece of that. So that's where implementation support comes in and helping you figure out how that fits into your practice. 
So the vision for CADIS um, is that health technology assessment informs every health technology decision. So what is health technology assessment? Um, that is a big portion of what we do at CADIS is what's known as health technology assessment. And essentially all it is is a kind of research. You're probably familiar with uh, qualitative research or randomized control trial. This is just another kind of research that we do at CADIS. And what's unique about a health technology assessment is that it often incorporates all of those different kinds of research into one place. So say we were reviewing um, uh, HPV testing as one of the HTAs we've done. So we'll look at the different um, methods of doing HPV testing and it will compare, you know, which is more effective in terms of providing you with the information that you need. But then an HTA will also include an economic analysis to show you, okay, well, which of the methods that there are possible is more cost effective. Um, it includes patient perspectives and experiences. Um, so it's including that qualitative research piece so we can understand, you know, how do patients feel about the different options, treatment options that they have available to them. Because I can, um, it is difficult to get that kind of information solely from a randomized control trial. A randomized control trial might tell you how effectively something works, but it doesn't tell you how that means to the actual patient. So that's why health technology assessment incorporates that kind of information in there. So you can just see there's lots of different components that go into a health technology assessment, the kind of research that we do. Now you will look and see, oh, there's a lot of different things in there. It must be quite a robust report, and they often are. So usually our health technology assessments can number in the hundreds of pages. There's a lot of information that's going into that one topic area. It can be a little bit overwhelming, so I'll show you some tools that we have so that you don't have to read 300 pages unless you really, really want to, which I encourage you to, of course. So our mission is to enhance the health of Canadians by promoting the optimal use of health technologies. So now what exactly is a health technology? It's not necessarily an intuitive um, 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 word, statement. So this is how we define health technologies at CADIS. So if you're ever wondering, say you have a research question and you're wondering, um, you're wanting some information on it. If you're wondering if it fits within CADIS, um, because um, as you'll see as I get into the slides, you can actually make requests for research evidence from CADIS. Um, uh, it has to fall within sort of these three broad categories in order for CADIS to review it. <clears throat> so the first is pharmaceuticals, so that's fairly straightforward. So if it's a drug or a vaccine, um, that certainly falls within CADIS mandate. Diagnostics as well, so laboratory tests, screening programs, medical imaging equipment, that all falls within CADIS mandate. The third category is the one that's definitely the most, um, the largest in terms of what you could possibly fit within um, CADIS scope. So it includes, so we call it clinical intervention. So obviously that includes any medical, dental, or surgical devices would certainly fall within CADIS scope. But it also includes, as it implies, any clinical intervention that you might do with a patient. So it might be, you know, how to do a specific kind of dressing change or how to do foot care, something like that. As long as the topic you're interested in is something that you would do for or with a patient, then it would fall within Catascope and we would cover it in the reviews that we do. So just something to keep in mind. So uh, when would you want to use Catas? So it depends what kind of information you're looking for in terms of what um, sort of product line you might want to use. So I'm going to go over these very briefly, just to give you examples of how you might uh, use some of the Catas resources. Um, so first is our drug reimbursement recommendations. Um, so you can access all of these reports on our website. So this is when we do uh, essentially a health technology assessment for individual medications. So these are usually at, or they are at the request of um, the submitters to our uh, drug review programs. But if you're ever wondering, you know, if a particular medication is covered under the Saskatchewan drug plan, um, but for certain, under certain criteria and conditions, and you want a little bit more background information to understand maybe why that is the case, you could potentially go back to the CADIS um, drug review uh, if there was one that was done, and chances are there would be to see why it was potentially recommended it be that way. 
It might not necessarily be the case. Uh, the drug plan is the one who ultimately decides the criteria. But a lot of times there is a good alignment between those reviews and um, the drug plan, so you can get a good understanding of why that might be the case. Next is our health technology management programs, and that's certainly the ones that are um, most highly relevant to um, nurses working in the clinical sphere. So I already talked a little bit about our health technology assessment, optimal use. So those are those really, really big reports, large in-depth reports on a particular health technology. Sometimes they come with, with recommendations to their use, and that's made by an expert review panel that we convene for each topic. So remember I said these are very long reports, hundreds of pages long, so they're quite time intensive. Take quite a bit of time to put together, but in the end you get some really useful information as it relates to that health technology. So for example, some recent, recent report we did was on um, what we call ICBT for major depressive disorder and anxiety disorder. So that is internet delivered cognitive behavioral therapy for um, depression and anxiety. So there was a question of this is a new treatment modality that's available to patients in some jurisdictions. Um, so traditionally, cognitive behavioral therapy is done in an office with a therapist, but now it can be offered through the internet. So the question was, well, is this effective? Does this work as well as, as in-person therapy? Is it cost effective? What are some of the implementation considerations to consider if I'm gonna start a program like this? So this report looked at all of those considerations, looked at all of the evidence available, and made a recommendation. And in this case, it was a positive recommendation that ICBT does have a place in, um, uh, as a therapy option for patients with uh, major depressive disorder and anxiety. So that's how, so if you're ever, you know, in a clinical situation where you're wondering, you know, how does this, you know, does this medical device fit with this patient or is this appropriate? Sometimes that's where Kat can answer those questions. I have some more examples at the end that I'll show you. We also have what's known as environmental scanning, and this is a snapshot of what is the current context for a particular health technology. So we gather this information for these reports in two ways. So first, we do a literature review to see what is published and available. And then we also do a survey of uh, hopefully the appropriate people who can answer the questions. So if you look at uh, one of our recent examples, non-pharmacological prevention of pressure injuries. So the question was, well, what is the best way to prevent pressure injuries? What are, what are other hospitals, long-term care facilities, um, jurisdictions, what are they doing to prevent pressure injuries was essentially the question. So that's why we did that survey, was to see what are all the different ways that um, pressure injuries are being prevented um, in the community, in the hospitals and long-term care facilities. Um, uh, just as a side note, and not surprisingly, it was found that there are lots of different ways that pressure injuries are being prevented um, in various settings. But it just gives you a good idea of how other facilities or jurisdictions are doing it as well. Um, next, we have a horizon scanning. So this is an examination of new and emerging technologies that may have an impact on the Canadian healthcare system. And although this isn't the technically right term, but it's sort of you know the cool um, new things that are coming um, to the market. Um, and these are things you might even read about in popular media. So for example, you can see there, um, clinical applications of 3D printing. So that's a fairly new technology, particularly new in the healthcare world. So this report would just summarize the information that we know about 3D printing in clinical settings, how it's being applied, and um, what evidence there might be to support that. Um, because these are new and emerging, there often isn't a lot of evidence on these topic areas, but it's still good to have that information as a baseline. Um, next, I'll talk about rapid response because it's by far our most popular service. Um, as the name implies, it is a rapid review of evidence available on a particular topic. And you can see the time range there. Um, so this is often when, like I said, a health technology assessment can take months and months and months to complete. We don't always have that amount of time. Um, then you might do a rapid response to get sort of a quick overview of the information on that topic. And I have a few examples to show you. I'm not going to go through the different kinds of rapid responses. If you ever do have a question for CATA that you want some evidence summarized on, then we would work with you to figure out, you know, which level would be appropriate. So 
Here's one example of a recent rapid response we did, or I guess well, semi-recent last April. So the topic was non-pharmacological interventions for the treatment of behavioral issues. So you can see here, these were the research questions that um, a clinician or an administrator posed um, on this topic. So what is the effectiveness of non-pharmacological interventions for the treatment of adults with behavioral issues? Um, so and this is likely, uh, this is an actual practice question is how, you know, what is the best way to manage um, these individuals with behavioral issues? What is the evidence saying is the direction I could possibly take? Um, so, so this report has the research questions, then there's an overall um, summary of the findings there. And this is a summary of abstracts you can see here. Um, so there was quite a few that were located. So then it was um, um, put into um, a table to summarize all of those findings. So then you can make a quick comparison of the different options out there. Here's another report we did just past this past November on intranasal and intramuscular naloxone for opioid overdose in the pre-hospital setting. So, um, so this report, so this particular report started with sort of a background section, this context and policy issues is sort of an introductory background section. And then you can see the research questions. So this was the questions that were posed to us. So, and you can probably get a good, make a good guess as to why this type of a question was asked, because there are different preparations for naloxone that can be used. Um, so which one is more effective, which one is more cost effective, um, you know, which will save more time, which is more appropriate in this particular setting. These are the kinds of questions they were wondering. And you can guess that it's probably, this came from an actual practice decision is when we're trying to administer this medication, what makes the most sense for these patients? So um, in this particular uh, rapid response, then there, we also did a critical appraisal of the actual studies that were located. And then there was a summary of findings that you can see. And then it finished with the conclusions and implications for decision or policy making. This is essentially the, the bottom line. This is what we found based on the evidence on this particular topic. So um, in this case, they found a guideline um, that were favored intranasal naloxone over intramuscular route, but it was based on very low quality evidence. And we'll talk a little bit about that later, what that means when you uh, get some of that low quality evidence. But these are just examples of the kinds of reports we have. Um, and I've sort of said it throughout, but these, all of these questions that we get, whether it be a health technology assessment or a rapid response, these questions are actually coming from um, clinicians, um, decision makers, administrators, ministries of health, government, cancer agencies, all these questions are coming from, from people out working in Canada on these issues. So we at Canada aren't creating these topics out of a vacuum. We don't think like, oh, uh, that would be an interesting topic, uh, intranasal versus intramuscular naloxone. Um, we get these questions from you as clinicians to understand, um, to obviously to meet your needs, and make sure we're covering content that's applicable. Okay, so moving on through our W's, where we are, where is CADETH located? So CADETH is a national organization, as you can uh, figure from the title. Um, we are located in all provinces and territories except for Quebec. So head office for Ottawa, or for CADETH, is in Ottawa, and we also have a large office in Toronto. And then as well, we're located across the country. Um, so essentially, there is one of me, a liaison officer, um, in every province and territory across the country. So you can see this is the team that I'm a part of um, at CADA. Um, I will say some of you probably are looking at this list, and at the, in the very top um, left-hand corner, you'll see the Saskatchewan team that I pointed out. You'll see Brenda Lynn Enns. Um, a lot of people are very familiar with Brenda Lynn Enns, and yes, she is still with CADA. Um, she was in... Um, my role as liaison officer before I started. Um, and even now still, I've been in this role for five years, I still go out and meet people and I still get asked about Brenda Lynn. And yes, she is still with Cadiz, so. Um, but the good thing about having all these team members across the country is then I can make connections if necessary with them to hopefully locate some information. So from time to time I have been asked, you know, um, you know, we're looking at, uh, we're managing this particular patient with this really complex um, condition, um, do you know of other practitioners and other jurisdictions who might be able to provide some insight? And we've been able to make those connections um, through our contacts. So 
So where else can you find Cadith? Well, you can also find Cadith online at cadith.ca. So hopefully this works. Um, so I hope you can slowly, whenever it loads, um, see the, the website. So www.cadith.ca is our main website. It is a free um, resource that you can use. So for all of you that are part of the SHA, you have excellent access to library resources. So this is essentially just another resource that you can use. Um, if you don't have access to the library resources, then um, it's nice to learn about Cadith because it's just a freely accessible website you can get anywhere um, and access our database. So cadith.ca. So I'll show you a little bit about the website, the easiest ways to access it. So honestly, the easiest way to find information is just to type in a keyword. So whatever you might be looking for, so maybe you're looking for old falls prevention material, you just type it in and click enter. And then it'll show you, you know, all of your results that are possibly related to falls prevention and their dates and the programs and things like that. So then you can just click on it and go to whatever report you might want to see. So um, that's usually the easiest way to search is just by um, a keyword. Um, the other way you can search is by reports. So if you are looking for, um, say you're looking at very specifically for, you know, a disease or condition, um, you can just click it in that way and it'll automatically refine it down for you um, based on your interest. So that's another way you can search if you're interested in. As well on the website, I'll point you to some of the resources we have because we have quite a few um, good resources. So if you click on resources, as it says, um, you'll see here along the left hand side a few options. Um, so evidence bundles. So if we've done a lot of um, prepared a lot of reports and research on a particular topic, we'll put it all in one place just so it's easier to search. So you'll see here some of our different evidence bundles. So we've done a lot of work on med medical cannabis, a lot of work on diabetes management. Um, so if you're interested um, in those particular topics, you can search in that way. So I'll click on, we'll say evidence on opioids. So you can see here, um, it's just a little bit easier for you to search some of the tools. And then we've broken it down by particular topic areas. So you're interested in pain treatment. Here's a bunch of recent reports on pain treatment. Um, so it's just helpful if you have a particular interest area. Um, so back to resources. Um, so there's a few other, um, if you're interested in knowing what projects we have in progress, you can click on here. Um, if for some reason you're uh, keen to do your own evidence searching, um, we have a couple of tools that you can use that just give you some options of places to search. So Gray Matters um, lists a bunch of other places online that you can search for information. So that's the Gray Matters tool, but um, there are excellent uh, literature searching uh, options for you out there uh, through the library. So, but, I mean, if you're very keen, it's a good resource for you. Um, or even for students, um, it's a good place to look for more information. Um, we do send out a monthly um, newsletter that lists all of the reports that we've done um, that month. So if you go onto the main page and scroll all the way to the bottom and go to subscribe, then you can sign up for that newsletter. So I know everybody gets lots of newsletters, but uh, the helpful thing about our um, new Cadith newsletter is we list all of the rapid response reports that were done that month by title. So then you can just simply click on the topics that are of interest to you. So, um, so my background in nursing is as an operating room nurse. So when, before I worked at Cadith, then I would just click through and if I saw something relevant to the OR, I would click on it and take me right to the report. Um, so that's just a little bit honestly a quicker way to keep up to date on what new reports are at Cadith. And then in that, that newsletter we'll also talk about if we're doing any um, events or webinars or things like that. We'll show up in that webinar or in that newsletter. Uh, so that's the website. Okay, so how do I use Cadith? Um, so I talked a little bit throughout the previous slides of how to use Cadith, um, and, you know, how to use the website and how to use their different products and services. Um, but you did notice probably when I showed that uh, picture of Canada that um, Saskatchewan has a bigger team compared to some of the other jurisdictions and that in fact is the case. Saskatchewan was actually the first jurisdiction within Cadith to offer enhanced implementation support. So prior to two years ago, 
Um, there was just me as Leah as an officer in Saskatchewan. Um, and then two years ago, we added two new roles, the program advisor and the implementation support officer. And what does that mean to you? It just essentially means we have greater capacity to do more um, work for you in a very simplistic way. But what we're trying to do is promote um, implementation support. So we want to move away from simply providing you with the evidence on a particular topic to how do we now incorporate that evidence into your decision making process. So there's lots of different things that our, our three team members can do. Um, so obviously I talked a lot about our different products and services, so rapid response and health technology assessments. Um, we certainly will help facilitate those requests and, and even identify what kinds of requests you might need. Um, maybe you have sort of a general thought of, well, I need some information on falls prevention, um, which is a pretty big topic. But we can help uh, work with you to figure out, okay, well, what specifically do you need to know about falls prevention and uh, what role does CATA um, evidence reviews have in that? Um, so we do that and um, we also provide educational opportunities and we have a variety of different ones um, so and some of you may have even attended in the past some of our critical appraisal workshops so these are simply um, um, learning how to read research appropriately and understand how it fits into your decision making process um, so we offer these types of workshops and are open to offering more in the future if there is interest and we offer them all over the province too i've i've provided workshops in Orange and Yorkton and Esther Hazy been all over. So um, we'll do presentations on the evidence, so on specific reports. So maybe if you've requested um, a rapid response or you noticed a rapid response or one of our other projects uh, in the newsletter and you think oh, that would be highly of interest to my nursing colleagues or um, clinicians in my area during our education day, we can come do those presentations on those topics. As well, um, new to our, our team here in Saskatchewan as we do and are in the process of developing new tools. So tools isn't necessarily an intuitive term, but essentially it's anything to make it easier to understand the evidence. So I had mentioned how our reports are in excess of, or are hundreds of pages long. It's a lot of work to read that amount of information. So we will take those hundreds of pages and make them into whatever is going to be the easiest way to use that information. So maybe that is an algorithm based on the evidence. What is the treatment regimen um, through an algorithm for, for this topic, or uh, might just be a short one page summary of all of that information in one place. Um, it might be taking that information and translating it into a patient resource. So obviously the material that we're creating is for a, uh, a clinician and a healthcare decision making audience. It's not necessarily specific to patients. So we might take some of that material and translate it so it's relevant to patients. Um, we always do these at the request uh, with a collaborator. So we don't occasionally, especially with our larger reports, we will create some um, tools to go along with it. But we really appreciate when someone says, you know, I have a specific audience that I need to use this with. Um, then we'll work with you to do that. So for example, we're in the process of developing a series of tools um, for patients who have chronic pain and it provides options uh, based or provides uh, the evidence on different options for managing their chronic pain. So what is the evidence around um, using acupuncture to manage your chronic pain or exercise or things like that. So we're making these tools specifically for patients based on reports that we would previously done. Um, this is another example. This one is not quite yet complete, um, but almost will be. <laughs> oh, excuse me. So this is meant to be used um, with patients as well um, who are on um, uh, opioid agonist therapy. Um, so some of the questions that they should be asking with their pharmacist and their clinician about the use of those medications um, for them. So this is done in collaboration with a provincial partner to create these for um, patients because it was identified that this was potentially um, an area that was lacking in resources for patients. So stay tuned for when those will come out. So that would be something in our new catalyst that you'd be made aware of that those tools are available. Okay, so why should you possibly use catalyst? <laughs> 
So this one I'm going to use just as a general example, sort of at a bigger picture um, lens. And then I'll give you a little bit more specific examples. <clears throat> Um, and I don't know why it says scenario two, because this is scenario one. But, so what if a Canadian jurisdiction is interested in harm reduction pertaining to opioid use? Which um, probably is every single Canadian jurisdiction. <laughs> so there's a couple of next steps that we can take. So Cadiz did a number of literature searches and evidence reviews in relation to this topic. So this is just a snapshot of some that are specific to um, naloxone. It's one means of harm reduction in the community setting. Um, so that's just a list of some of those reports. Um, I could also click here on the evidence bundle for opioids, as I showed you previously, to, and you saw the, the piles and piles of uh, research that we've done in this topic area, because obviously it's highly relevant currently. So that's one, that's sort of the first step, is let's gather all of the evidence on this topic um, so we have a better idea of um, Oh, so we have a better idea of, of our knowledge to date and what we might be currently lacking. The next step might be let's do an environmental scan to see how are different jurisdictions managing um, different harm reduction strategies. <clears throat> so we did a uh, an environmental scan on publicly funded and managed naloxone programs in Canada. So this is an environmental scan you can access on our website. It was done in March 2018. And so we did a survey to see what is available in terms of uh, naloxone in each jurisdiction. And then from that information, we created this infographic. So the actual environmental scan is probably I don't know, uh, 50 to 60 pages or something in there. Uh, not terribly long, it's not one of the hundreds of pages of reports, but it's still a lot of information contained in there. So then to make it a little bit easier for people to use that information, we put it into this infographic so you can kind of quickly compare each of the jurisdictions. Now, the only caveat with um, this environmental scan at this present point in time is the information that we collected in, uh, well, part of the end of um, 2017 was relevant to that time and the end of 2017. So obviously things have changed quite a bit in this space in the past um, year and a half. So um, some of this information might not be up to date. But at the time of when that information was collected, it was highly valuable for each jurisdiction to understand how we're uh, managing uh, the lock zone programs. As well related to that, um, uh, a specific uh, CADF paper was created on policy tools to support appropriate opioid prescribing. So this is just an example of something that, um, um, as I showed you in the, initially in that diagram, um, evidence is certainly one piece of the puzzle when we're trying to make a decision, um, but it doesn't always answer all the questions. So it's um, so this was done to show um, what policies are available and have shown to support appropriate opioid prescribing and how are those programs implemented. So that kind of information that might be find we would find in a document like this. Okay, but let's think about why should I use Cadeth more um, for, for you as an individual nurse. Um, so um, like I said, my background is uh, an operating room nurse and I certainly used Cadeth before, before I came to Cadeth. I use the resources to uh, inform my practice and my decision making and how would you possibly do that? So I put up a couple of examples here on the screen. And these I'm sure are questions you have every single day when you practice as a nurse, I'm sure you could think of hundreds more of questions that you have and you wonder um, what is possibly the answer. So, um, so, Shouldn't my patient with a tissue infection be on IV antibiotics, not oral? So, you know, maybe you have this patient in front of you, tissue infection, they're on oral antibiotics. And perhaps just based on the um, knowledge that you had to, to date, you think, oh, shouldn't they be on IV antibiotics? How do I answer that question? So, Kadith did a report on this particular topic oral antibiotics versus IV. So legitimately, um, the question was asked, you know, it, are IV antibiotics better um, than oral antibiotics? And there's many reasons you would want to compare this. Um, cost effectiveness is one, but it's certainly patient ease of, of taking, you know, IV is, there's a lot more risks associated with having an IV. So can I give them oral antibiotics versus IV? Um, so this was a summary of abstracts that we did. <clears throat> And you can see here, 
um, some of the results that they had. So the generally, you'll find a lot of these reports, the evidence is a little bit um, mixed, but they did find some studies um, that compared the two. So the authors of a systematic review found no um, evidence to support the use of IV antibiotics over oral antibiotics, or, but with the caveat that you know, there was a lot of high quality evidence available. Um, another study found no significant difference in treatment failure at 72 hours uh, or clinical cure at seven days uh, between the two. Um, there was a guideline that was found um, from Knights, which is a UK organization, highly reputable, and they recommend oral antibiotics be used as first line therapy if the patient can take them. So that's, once again, part of that decision-making process. Um, of course, only one piece of that puzzle. So these are the kinds of questions that um, individuals are having. So what's another one? Um, is cognitive behavioral therapy a good option for patients to manage chronic pain? Does it work? I'd be curious to know. So this was a question too. So, um, you know, maybe this was from a administrator wondering, should we be offering cognitive behavioral therapy to uh, individuals in chronic pain? So this was a summary with critical appraisal. So a lot of information contained in this report. It's quite a bit longer. So these were some of the results they found. So this one is obviously far more uh, in depth. Um, so obviously, I, uh, one of the workshops I do, I always call, I say, you never should just read the abstract of a research study. You need to read the full um, article to fully understand what it's actually saying. So, um, so I'm kind of going against that by only showing you the conclusion section. Um, of course, you would read the whole report to fully understand um, what they're actually trying to say. But in the interest of time today, that's why I'm kind of skipping to the, to the end. So there was evidence to show that the clinical effectiveness of, cog of cognitive behavioral therapy in patients with chronic pain, um, they showed that CBT reduced the frequency of chronic headache in children. Um, for patients with chronic low back pain, CBT was associated with pain reduction compared with weightless control. So there was some evidence to show that cognitive behavioral therapy um, may work for people who have um, chronic pain. Okay, um, what about are ingestible devices for monitoring medication adherence actually a thing? So this is one of those topics that um, specifically in popular media, um, you'll see, you know, that headline that grabs you and you think, oh my god, is that actually a thing that's really happening? Um, my favorite headline that I saw one time just, you know, in a regular uh, news app was uh, type 2 diabetes cured. And this was a reputable news source. This wasn't um, social media. This was a reputable news source. So I actually went and read the article. Um, and there was a lot of holes in that article. Um, but just to say that sometimes, um, you know, new medical devices might be sensationalized in the media. And so you always want to take a step back and say, okay, is that actually a thing? So maybe you saw an article about ingestible devices that will monitor medication adherence. Is that actually a thing? So um, Cadiz did look at ingestible sensors for monitoring medication adherence. Um, so this was in a horizon scan. So this is a new and emerging topic. Um, so the first question you might say is, oh, can I get this in Canada? And at the time of this um, publishing of this report, and this one's quite recent, um, these devices were not currently available in Canada. Um, but it just goes to show that maybe these will be something coming to Canada. So if you're wondering what this is, it's actually it's something that the patient takes and then it senses if they've actually taken their medications. So then it gives you a little bit of background about what it is, if there is any ev evidence available on that topic, um, just to give you a better understanding. Um, so these are quite helpful for you when you're faced with that situation of, you know, you hear about something new and you're not even, even sure if it's available or some new landmark therapy, this can be quite helpful to actually understand some of the background information for that um, topic. Okay, um, wouldn't it be nice if my patient's humidified oxygen was also heated? I particularly picked this one because as you may have noticed, I'm suffering from a cold and it would have been nice if my uh, humidifier was heated last night, as it certainly was not, um, but is it better to have heated humidified high flow oxygen? For respiratory support. Um, I certainly would have thought so last night. Um, so this was another report. So when you do click on reports, this is the first landing page that you'll be brought to, sort of the, 
introductory page. And if you want the actual report, then you just click over here under the files section, and that'll take you to the reports that I've been showing you. So in terms of this topic, the reason I didn't take it to the actual report is this was actually quite lengthy. They found quite a bit of evidence. Um, so the evidence suggests that heated humidified high flow oxygen may help to avert the need for intubation relative to conventional oxygen therapy. Um, so, uh, so there is some evidence to show that it might be beneficial in that case. So for myself last night, I maybe did not need the heated humidified high flow oxygen, um, but um, for you know, patients in respiratory distress, there might be some evidence that shows that it is effective. Um, so like I said, these are all clin clinical questions that you might be having um, and wondering what, what, how do I find some information on them? Um, finally, what is the best way to assess my laboring mom to determine her fall risk? Obviously, we don't want um, our laboring moms falling. So, so, you know, what are some of the guidelines out there or what is some of the evidence out there to tell me is the best way to see, uh, to assess a fall risk in an obstetric uh, patient? So maybe you have this question and you submit it to Cadith and then this is what you get back. No relevant literature was identified. Womp womp. So this does happen from time to time and it's a little bit disappointing um, because for anyone who's looking for research on a particular topic, the fact that you're even looking for evidence on that topic is showing that you're doing your due diligence you're making sure you are as informed as possible before you make um, a decision further. Um, so what do you do when you get this kind of a report back? It is a little bit disappointing, um, but we can work with you to find, um, to see if there's another route that we could go to see if we can try and find some more information. Sometimes in a report like this, there might be some further information um, in the appendix, um, but that's not always helpful either. But um, that's just part of the one of the challenges of actually, you know, trying to incorporate evidence informed decision making into your practices. Sometimes the evidence doesn't always have the answers for you. Um, but it's always a good first step to incorporate that into um, your practice. Um, so, um, so I think I've covered all my W's and my H. Um, so there are many ways you can stay connected with us. We're of course on Twitter and you can go to our website. Um, you can email um, our team in Saskatchewan at sksupport at cadith.ca um, if you have any questions or evidence needs. And if you're ever wondering throughout this uh, presentation, you know, what can I, I think, I hope I've made it clear, you can definitely access the resources we have, but um, a lot of you out there can also be the ones requesting this information as well. You can be the ones that are creating essentially these rapid response reports based on the research questions that you have. Um, so if there's, if you're trying to influence a practice decision or inform clinical practice in some way, or um, CADIS can be a resource for you um, to help find uh, some of those, that information, then uh, take the next steps in implementing it because um, getting the evidence is only the first step. So um, that's all the slides I have. I managed to avoid a coughing fit, so that's great news. Um, open to any questions if anyone has any. Um, go ahead. So Kathleen, so far I don't see any questions uh, on the chat box. Mm -hmm. But I, I just um, just was uh, very enthralled with this talk uh, as I'm a very strong believer in Cadeth. I know you talked about students and one of the questions I have is some of the people who will maybe be looking at this webinar later on are students or maybe they're participants, you know, preceptors who work with students. So how would you suggest uh, that the students and their preceptors incorporate CADETH into their learning? What are some ideas that you think might work for them? So CADIS is a great resource for students. Um, I do go out and do presentations to various uh, student groups about CADIS and um, uh, different components of CADIS and evidence and things like that. Um, it's a great resource. So first off, um, I, it's not cheating, but sometimes, you know, if you're working on, you know, a clinical project or, um, you know, paper or your case studies or things like that, um, and you're trying to find some of the information or evidence related to your topic, uh, CADF is a good place to start uh, your search because what if CADF has already done some of the topics that you're looking at, you know? What if you're 
um, your case study was looking at, you know, heated humidified oxygen. Um, Kadath can maybe save you a couple of steps because we've already compiled all that information in one place for you as well. Um, so that's a really great way that students can access um, Kadath. As well, the patient resources that we do have, um, especially if students are working so closely one-on-one -on -one with patients in their clinical rotations, um, those are good resources to use uh, as well. Perfect. Okay, thanks. Uh, the other interesting thing as I think about as we're talking uh, with the continuing competency program and so many of what we're learning about in terms of trauma-informed care, you know, and I'm just suggesting maybe Kadith would have some good information on that because that's relatively uh, new to the competencies for mm -hmm. this RNA. So, um, you know, just to see, I'm wondering if, you know, nurses and students will be able to find information on that. I also appreciate one thing I have found with Cadiff, and you talked about that in one of your slides, is that the plain language, you present this information in plain language, and that just makes it so much more engaging because uh, people can read this and, and it makes sense. One other question I had is you said that said, uh, people can always submit questions. Do, can we just submit mm -hmm. to requests at Cadiff, say, I would like to know more about this, or I have an idea that this might be a good uh, something to research? Is that the best way to do it or is there a s special? Uh, hmm, the best way to do it is probably the SK support at cadeth.ca because then it'll connect directly with our Saskatchewan team and then we essentially triage um, which one of us will <laughs> take on that request depending on um, sort of you know what that request is going to be used for or you know if it's something that down the line is going to turn into you know a patient tool then you know, we want to make sure that Krista Kaminsky gets involved. Um, so that's the best way is just contact SK support. And, and we never want you. So I showed you how to use the website and um, how to find resources. But don't feel bad if you've looked on the website and you're like, I just can't find it. Contact us and see if we can find it. Um, and then if we can't find it, then we know we can help you take the next steps to find some appropriate um, information. Or if you have a question, you're like, I'm not sure if this fits within Cadet. Once again, just send us an email and ask and, um, you know, there's no harm in asking us. That's our job. That's our role is to make sure that our information is getting out um, to the right people and we're facilitating those connections. So just, you know, we're never, we're always like, I'm always excited to hear from, from new people who are interested in CADIS and have questions for CADIS. So uh, just send an email to that SK support at CADIS.ca and then we'll uh, figure out what next steps we need to take. Like I said, even if it's just a simple question of, I cannot find this report, um, we'll help you find it, hopefully. <laughs> Wonderful, well, thank you. I think this presentation was excellent. I think you've um, given us a hidden treasure that not all of us have been able to find. Yes. So, um, it is very, very appreciated. Uh, and on that note, again, thank you. Uh, I will just give a little bit of the next webinar uh, will be on February 19th and it will be there will be a speaker uh, coming from Choosing Wisely Canada so they will be able to uh, give us some information on that. Uh, if you have missed any webinars you can view many of them including this webinar on SRNA's Vimeo or YouTube channels and finally thank you again Kathleen um, for yes, joining. Thank you, thank you very much. See you next time. <laughs>